You can open your Bibles, if you will, please, to the book of Jeremiah. One of my favorite passages out of this book of Jeremiah has been the story of the potter. I, I guess in my lifetime I preached on it a lot more than I probably should have because some folks might have got tired of hearing it. <laughs> but it's just one of those stories that just uh, is always has so much that it wants to say to me. So it's lesson number seven, the potter's hand, Jeremiah 18. Now last week's message, if you'll remember, anybody remember what the title for last week's lesson was? Okay, it's too much to ask because you know what? I can't either sometimes. You know, it's a strange thing to say, but it, even in preaching sometimes they'll say, what did you preach on last week? And for the life of me, I can't remember what I preached on last week. I mean, it's not that uh, I, I don't think it's important, but for some reason or another I get so much Brother Evans will know what I'm talking about. You get so much going through your mind that you kind of blur everything that you did. But it says stay focused on God's directives when criticized. Now, I just criticized myself. And so I'm going to try to stay focused, more focused, on, uh, on God's directives and just be able to clear up. Of course, I've got an excuse. I'm 86 years old. <laughs> now, Brother Evans has got even more excuse than I got, but he remembers what he preaches on. So, uh, Brother Evans, I congratulate you. <laughs> All right, let's take a look. Potter's hands on this. Staying focused on God's directive. But this one today, the example of the potter. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. Let's consider the first two verses, if we will, here. Jeremiah 18, 1 and 2 says, And the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, You know, wouldn't it be really just wonderful to be able to say, I had the word from the Lord? We sometimes, I know myself, if I'm not really walking well, I don't want to just say like I, I don't want to say like I've always got out of fellowship with the Lord or something, but sometimes I don't feel like I'm able to walk as close as I would like to. And there's sometimes I've said, Lord, please uh, tell me what you want me to preach, or uh, Lord, what which direction you want the church to go. Well, Jeremiah, when he remember when we started in the first chapter, God told Jeremiah, I said, now. You're going to preach what I tell you, and they're not going to like you. Well, now I've got an advantage on Jeremiah. I'm privileged to pastor churches that, that love me, and especially this one here. It just amazes me, never ceases to amaze me, the love that this church is showing for me, my wife and I. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. In other words, God said to this prophet, I'm assigning you a place to go to hear the word. And he says, now when you get there, he said, there I will cause thee to hear my words. What was he saying? He says, Jeremiah, I'm not going to talk to you about anything that I want you to know until you get where I want you to be. So could this perhaps mean that there are God-assigned places? where God says that he would choose to reveal his word and give understanding? Could this be the church today? It is. It's a place that God says, Forsake not the assembling yourselves together, the manner of some is, so much the more as you see the day approaching. Well, why does he want us together? He wants us together to hear from God's word. And you know, today the grief is that so many churches meet and don't bother with God's Word, but they meet for about everything else other than hearing the Word of God. And you folks tonight, you have made your way from your different homes and your different jobs and stuff, and you came tonight because you wanted to hear 
what God has to say to us. And that's why that I've always taken so seriously and so uh, deeply in my soul that I have an assignment from God to try to feed the flock of God, which he's made me overseer of. So we find this. God has always said, he even said that there's another place. And I liked what he said to the Jews. He said, you write the law of God on the doorposts of your homes. He also challenges the parents to teach the children the word of God. We don't have a whole lot of that going on anymore. Family devotions are just about a thing of the past. Used to be that I would encounter uh, families that they were actually involving in family devotions. They met formally. But, you know, I found a lot of times that that's just not the case in the homes. They don't sit down with their children. They don't sit down with husband and wife sometime and just read some of the scriptures. You know, we have Bible programs that helps you to read through the Word of God and everything like that, but that even is not pursued. We've gotten so enmeshed in doing so much that we just don't uh, keep track of that. Now, this was, I call it an allegory. I think there's another name for it, but what it is is an earthly illustration of a heavenly truth, in a sense. Jesus used the term, I used the allegory a lot when he talked about different things, try to get it to the understanding of his people. This allegory of Jeremiah 18, 3 and 4, 3 says this, Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. In other words, he said, I'm here now, Lord, and I'm serving this potter, and he's doing a work on the wheels. Now, you said come down here and you'd speak to me. Well, God was simply putting a point across to Jeremiah that we need to not forget because it's a lesson for us. He said, I went down to the potter's house and he wrought a work on the wheels. In other words, he was there. He could see him put clay on the turnstile and was beginning to do a work on it. And he began to give kind of a illust illustrative lesson to the prophet there. He said, he wrought a work on the wheels and the vessel that he made of clay. Clay is a symbol of man. We're clay. We came forth from the dust of the earth, and all it keeps us from the dust of the earth is a little water on us. Then we become mud, and then we get a hardness about it. We become clay. But the thing of it is, he said, the vessel that he made was of clay. So what he's going to show and say to him that this illustration is going to be concerning man. He said, this clay was marred in the hand of of the potter. In other words, this make this this didn't work out. This vessel or whatever it was he was creating just simply did not make out. But then it says for the potter, that's not a problem. It said, so he made it again. In other words, you've seen pictures of it, and some of you may even work with uh, uh, clay. And uh, what they did said so that didn't turn out right, so it just put it all back together and put it back on the wheel and do it again. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. What really basically God is saying through him is God, God is saying to him, I make people what they need to be or what they should be. I give them opportunity. I work with them. They're clay, but it's a responsibility that I have a right to do. So we have some principles involved from the potter as they begins to work with the hands. First of all, we understand one thing. God made us. From the dust of the earth, he created Adam. And from the rib of Adam, he made Eve. So God made us. Isaiah 64, 8 substantiates this thought when it says, But now, O Lord, thou art our father, and we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we are all the work of thy hand. We are all the work of the hand of God. He makes us and he uses us as he so fits. So then we find this. He prepares us for his purposes. What he's really saying is he, not every vessel I make is for the same purpose. Some preachers, some teachers, 
Some, as we get through the scriptures, uh, some have a talent for music. Uh, some are handsome. And some are, are, are like me. They're not. They're just ugly. But anyway, the thing of it is, he has a, prepares us for his purposes. But, you know, we get so busy about our purposes that we don't have time to talk to God and find out from God what is his purpose when our life. We get so caught up in the activities of the world and so easy to do. It's easy for preachers to do. It's easy for anybody to do. Get caught up in the world and not realize that, that God has had us made us for his purpose. So it says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11, he said, According to the eternal purpose which he proposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God has a purpose in every being that has ever lived. Now some of the beings did not uh, fulfill the purpose God created them for, that the some did. He, he said he made Pharaoh. And Pharaoh didn't turn out right. He was an uh, enemy of the children of God, the chosen children of God. But he says at a place, I forgot the verse right now, but he said he made Pharaoh for purpose. And the purpose was that he'd be a persecutor of his chosen people. Well, can any deny that God has the right to do with us whatever he chooses? God does have that right. But, you know, we are more interested uh, and maybe doing what we want with us. But we need to understand God has a purpose. He said Ephesians 11, according to his eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, just like he sent his son. The purpose of his son was to redeem the lost and dying world. So when we begin to get into this, the sovereign God is in this case, in this illustration, in this allegory, is the potter. Verse 18, 5 through 8 says, God in his sovereignty over his people, Jeremiah 18, 5 and 6. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Now remember, he said that you go down to the potter's house, and he said, There. He said, I'll reveal my word. So he was teaching, actually he was teaching Jeremiah a lesson that he needed to understand that he was just a vessel, made for God because we find Jeremiah as we've already looked at some days he's doing pretty good other days he's complaining about the lot and the circumstances he had so God basically was reminding uh, his uh, prophet uh, uh, that that he was still in charge Jeremiah 8 5 and 6 then the word of the Lord came unto me saying all right now God's ready he's at the potter's house he's where he's supposed to be so the Lord speaks to him again and here's the message that he gives his uh, prophet, and it's for O house of Israel. And the message is a reminder. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? He said, I want you to go back and talk to my people in Judah and tell them, I have a right. I can do with you as this potter. I can mold you. I can break you. I can change you. I can fit you any way that I so desire to do, saith the Lord, because, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. Now, notice something else here. He said, O house of Israel. He is speaking now of all the tribes again. He says, I have a right to do with you as I choose to do. Remember, the northern kingdom has been gone now. They, went, they were called away in, into, um, oh my, let me try to think of the king. I can't think of him, but anyway, it was into the Syria. Up into there, they were hauled away. But he said, the clay is in my potter's hand. Now, the sovereignty of God was recognized as Judah pled for restoration. Back in the book of Isaiah, we find this. It says, but now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, and thou art our potter, and we are the work of thy hand. Be not wroth, very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. In other words, here is a prophet a pleading for all of Israel, the entire tribes, the ten entire tribes. And I remember ten of them are already out in, uh, in, in uh, prison, and only, only about... Uh, 60,000 of them would return. He said, 
Remember that iniquity forever, will you? Well, he didn't with those that he had carried off into captivity. Sixty years, and he brought them back to rebuild the temple and then to repopulate uh, the lands. And he said, remember that we have see, see, we are a people. The holy cities now, he says, this is what they are. The holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. And Jerusalem is a desolation. Because this was probably written while the siege was going on with Nebuchadnezzar. And they, the conditions were so bad in Jerusalem that they actually uh, would eat their babies or they would trade eating their children. And uh, they eat all the dogs, they eat all the rats, everything they could get. That was the condition. And yet they held out against God and held out against uh, Nebuchadnezzar for a long time. He said, the holy cities are a wilderness. Now, how did he mean that? Not a wilderness like we know, a wilderness or trees. And, but they were, there were absolutely no vestige left of any relationship with God or anything. And he said, Zion is a wilderness. And Jerusalem is a designation. He said, this is an entire picture of all that I had given Abraham. All that David had attained. And David's kingdom stretched clear uh, up to uh, the river, uh, uh, the Euphrates. There. And he was where Syria is today. David once ruled all this. God had given it all. So here he's to remind him, the holy cities. What holy cities? It's a plural. What he's referring to is any of the cities, the uh, places, the fortress cities that God had told his people to build, all those that were belonging to the Jews. He said, these, he said, it's a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem is desolation. And our holy and our beautiful house. What's what he talking about there? The temple. He said, our holy and our beautiful house where our fathers praise thee is burned up with fire and all of our pleasant things are laid waste. In other words, he said, what's happening to you, Israel or Judah, is what I've said I have a right to do because you have turned your back on me. So God's statement is a principle of sovereignty or God's sovereignty over the nations. God's sovereignty is over all the nations, not just his chosen people, not just the northern kingdoms and the southern kingdoms, because Jeremiah rehearses a fact here for us in these uh, verses here. Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10. He said, at what instant I speak concerning a nation. He didn't say concerning his people. He said, at what time I speak concerning a nation, that means the Gentiles all included. And as far as the Jews concerned, there's only two groups, Jew and Gentile. So it covers the entire world. He said, at what instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom. Now, what is the kingdom? That is an empire like the Roman Empire, like the Grecian Empire, like Alexander's great empire that he had. He said, uh, uh, concerning a kingdom, he said, to pluck it up and to pull it down and to destroy it. Now, here it is. This is covering every nation that has existed and every nation that will exist from the time point of Jeremiah's statement. He said, if a nation against whom I have pronounced, in other words, the term pronounced in, uh, I think it's Chaldean, but it means past judgment on. In other words, when a nation, God is the Lord of all the nations, rather the nations recognize it not. Uh, uh, rather, we, 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 we're one nation under God, we say. We were at one time, but the whole thing is, he said, uh, against whom I pronounced or past judgment, he says this, he said, if they turn from their evil, in other words, if they repent of their evil, if they have a, shall we say, a, a nationwide revival, if they, from the top to the bottom, they turn from their evil and, and go back to God, if they repent, he said, I'll repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. In other words, he said, they are under my wrath. They have sinned against me. He said, but if they will repent. Well, this is the same thing he was saying to uh, Judah. 
That was the whole message of Jeremiah. Repent, come back to God. He said it under Josiah. He said it under the three sons of Josiah. He said it under the grandson. He said it when they were really battering the walls of Jerusalem, the last stronghold in the land that God had given his people. He was still playing. He said, if they repent, but they didn't repent. They turned their back upon it. Even in the theros of the grief and the sorrow of utter destruction, they would not repent from the evil. He said, I will repent from the evil that I thought to do unto them. In other words, God said to them, I'll carry you off into captivity. I've chosen the heathen to be my weapons and my tools. And he said, I'll close you. So let's consider this. The next two verses fit well, not just Judah, and not just, well, Israel. He said, at what, at what, and at what instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build it and to plant it? In other words, what do we say? We're founded on God. He gave us our America. We're a Christian nation. But here he's saying this. At what instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, build it and to plant it. And listen, that's, that's all we could owe. Everything we were in America and everything we have left in America that's right, it has to be in the hand of God. Verse 10, if they do evil in my sight and that it obey not my voice. What's the voice of God today? The preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible. We say we have a Constitution, we have a Bill of Rights, but the foundation of the Constitution and the foundation of the Bill of Rights is the Holy Scriptures. So he said, if they cite and they obey not my voice, in other words, preaching, we need as a nation to get back to God, we need revival, but repent of the good wherewith I have said I would benefit them. He said, first of all, he said, I'm going to start taking the blessings away. He said, I'll repent of the good. Where if I said I would benefit them. And then the nation just keeps going downhill. God withdraws his blessings from this. God withdraws his blessings for that. This fails, that fails until the nation really becomes. And he said, Damn, could this be why the blessings that we have in this country are fast disappearing? I think so. Because I believe with all of my heart we are no longer a Christian nation. We are a nation founded under God, but we are so far from the Word of God, the practice of the truth, and all of our blessings that we had at one time, they're just disappearing, aren't they? Just disappearing. So that's believe is what he says there, and that's a principle that works not only just on us as a nation, but on any nation in the world. So now we come to Judah's disobedience. Even in the final hours of God's grace, which still extended for his people to come back to him. That's what Jeremiah is saying. If, if you, I've taken all the good things away from you, but you still haven't repented. He said, I've taken it all. Now the final hours have come here, Jeremiah 18, 11. He said, now therefore go to speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That was all that was left. Just Jerusalem under siege. All the outer fortress cities of Judah had been torn down and destroyed by the armies of Nebuchadnezzar. There was nothing left. He said, he said, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and to devise a device against you. Return ye now, every one from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. God was pleading right up to the very final days of the siege of God's people. All the land was laid waste. All the cities were gone. All that was left was Jerusalem, and there's the, the conditions that they were in. There was no way they could ultimately resist this. So Judah's answer came in the form of what? Continual depravity, Jeremiah 18, 12. And they said, there is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices. They said, God, we don't need you. We'll get out of this on our own. We have a stance, and it goes on, he says this. We'll walk after our own devices. We will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. In other words, they said, 
we're going to get out of this. We're going to restore everything. We're going to make what we once were. And God, we don't need you at all. And they were on the very verge of ultimate extinction. So we find this, Israel's punishment by the potter, a spiritual adultery, Jeremiah 18, 13, 15. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, ask ye among the heathen who have heard such things. The virgin of Israel hath done a very horrible thing. Will a man leave the snow of Lebanon, which cometh from the rock of the field? Or shall the cold flowing waters that come from another place be forsaken? What he's saying here is, he said, I have blessed you from within, and I have blessed you from without. He said, you've turned your back on the refreshment times that I've given you, when I have sent prophets to you, when I have strengthened and encouraged you, when I've given you victories, when you could not have possibly won. He said, you've turned it around. Even the, even the River Jordan comes from where Syria is now. I've been at the headwaters. It comes out of a mountain. And I thought, how, how appropriate that the water that supplies all the Jordan Valley down to the Dead Sea comes out of a mountain, which is in, in Syria. And so he said, I, I, or shall the cold flowing waters, in other words, when you see that spring, that mountain, it runs into streams, and I put my hand down in it, and just like ice, it was cold. And he also talks about another way. He said he could make trade and blessings flowing from other nations to cease. You know, that we, we've done it with embargoes on country, but God says, I'll do it. I have nothing that will come into you that will help you or will bless you, is what he's really saying. 15, because my people have forgotten me. They have burned incense to vanity. They have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient path to walk in the paths in a way not cast up. He said they've gone in a way that I didn't make. They've made their own path, and they're walking in it. So Jeremiah 18, 16, 17 says, To make their land desolate and a perpetual hissing. It's what he did to Babylon, remember? Uh, people wouldn't even go to Babylon. made a, a prayer for will. But he said, I'll make your, this land desolate. It'll be a perpetual hissing. <laughs> right now, nobody around them likes them. It's a sense that they... Israel, Israel. And so he said, a perpetual hissing. Everyone that passes thereby shall be astonished and wag his head. And I will scatter them with an east wind. That's a desert wind. That's right off the desert. Before the enemy, I will show them the back and not the face in their day of calamity. God says, we're getting now to the place where I'm just simply going to Turn my back on my people. And that's hard for God to do. They were his chosen, but he turned his back. He I'll show them my back and not the face in their day of calamity. I'll not answer their pleadings or entreaties any longer, even when they would offer up the correct offerings, because the temple of God was gone. But they knew how to make an offering. They knew what blood offerings were required. Uh, but he said, I'll not answer their pleadings. I'll not even, uh, even with their correct offerings. He said, I'll pay no more attention. In captivity, they did them. They had to be doing, done in secret. But God didn't respond to any of the offerings that they made while they were in captivity. They were almost useless. It wasn't long till Israel just really began to uh, uh, fit the lifestyle of the people that were their conquerors. So, the people's rebellion against the prophet. Now, here it is, Jeremiah 18, 18. Then said they, come and let us devise devices against Jeremiah. <laughs> what they're really saying, we need to get rid of this troublemaker. We need to get rid of this guy. So they begin to devise devices. You can read through the bank of Jeremiah. They had a lot of things to Jeremiah. They locked him up. They threw him in one dungeon where you sunk to the armpits. You had to hold your arms out not to drown in it. Left him there in the city of Jerusalem until uh, the speeds fell and he was taken out. He said, uh, he said uh, well, I lost my place. They devised devices against you whom they considered a troublemaker. In other words, he was God's prophet, but they didn't consider him a prophet. 
they just considered him a, a troublemaker. For the law shall not perish from the priests, nor the counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Now, they, what they're saying is here, the reads a little tricky. But the law shall not perish, yet we have still got the law. And, you know, God, we're his chosen. And God will take care of us, is what they're saying. He said, the law shall not perish from the priest, nor the counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. In other words, we've got, we've got prophets. Jeremiah was the only one that was really telling them they couldn't succeed. Jeremiah was the only one telling them they were going to the prophet. They had those prophets that was giving them a good message. They had those prophets, and they had said, we've got the prophet, we've got the priest, and we've got wise men, and so we really don't need them. We have our own priests and our own knowledgeable leadership. They will see us through. You know, that's about the kind of message we have in America today, isn't it? Our leaders will see us through. God doesn't have any place in our leadership of our nation anymore. You'll have a few Christians in the halls of Congress or in the Senate, but not very many. So he says here, they said, we'll get rid of this one. Now let us smite him with the tongue. In other words, talk bad about him. Accuse him of lying. And you read the principle, the book of Jeremiah, you'll see that that comes to pass. They'll discredit him and they'll discredit his message. And let us not give heed to any of his words. You know, for a while, Jeremiah had a following. And he would plead the cause of God. And those men and those families, a few of them, would stand by him. But as it got down to the end, even these seemed to lose heart as far as the message of God was concerned. So this is the same tactic we see going on today. The godless, and I believe you'll agree with me, the godless have the reins of power in America today. And it's very evident that these have no use for our Bible. Couldn't even find a Bible to swear in a Supreme Court justice about 15 years ago. Pretty bad, isn't it? They don't swear a Bible. And one, uh, who was it was sworn in with the Koran here recently? I forget which one. But there wasn't a word of God that he, he took his oath about for our nation on. But he had no use for the Bible and even less for we which believe in it. When a man or a woman is elected to office who believes he and acts on these Christian principles upon which America is founded, they are attacked, and efforts are made to discredit them. That's going on today. For us, it's going on today. So the prophets, revengeful prayer. Now the prophet says, all right, I'm going to pray one more prayer. Here it is. He said, Jeremiah 8, 1923, he said, Give heed to me, O Lord. And hearken to the voice of them that contend with me. Listen to what they're saying and what they plan to do to me. Shall evil be recompensed for good? For they have digged a pit for my soul. Remember that I stood before thee to speak good of them and to turn away thy wrath from them, but since they'll not hear. Therefore, deliver up their children to the famine. And that was exactly what was happening. Their children to the famine. And pour out their blood by the force of the sword. That's Nebuchadnezzar in the forces that overran the last of what was, was called was Judah. Let their wives be bereaved of their children and be widows. Many of them were. They'd lost their husbands in combat, or thus their young people, the young folks in the military of the of the of the city, and they were all taken, just as God said. He said, Let a cry be heard in their houses. When shalt thou bring a troop suddenly upon them? For they have digged a pit to take me and hid snares from my feet. He's telling God this as if God didn't already know. He was fully aware of what was happening to his prophet. Yet, Lord, thou knowest all their counsel against me to slay me. Forgive not their iniquity, neither blot out their sin from thy sight, but let them be overthrown before thee. Deal thus with them in the time of thine anger. Have we not prayed thus when things aren't going well? Lord, why don't you do something with that cranky old neighbor of mine? Why don't you do something with, well, in a sense, we're praying, why don't we do something with, uh, well, I won't say it. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we are, aren't we? We, we? we tend to fall into that pattern. 
saying, you know, get rid of them for me, God. I, I can't get rid of them. Get rid of them for me, God. That's basically what. Thus we have prayed and things are not going well. So what kind of a message could we attach to what we have studied tonight? And I've been way too long, but here it is. Recognize God's sovereignty. That's something we always need to recognize. God's in charge of our lives. It's important. Father, we thank you for our time together. We ask now, Lord, that you will dismiss us with your blessings, that we will have drawn something that will encourage and strengthen or awaken us to the needs that we have as a dying Christian nation. And we'll thank you and praise you. In his name I pray.